Seems like 
Lord, we thank you that your, your love is the thing that we can build our lives upon, that your word is. Father, in the name of Jesus, that that's unshakable. There are things that we deal with in our everyday life that we put our confidence in, that we get excited about, and if they don't turn out the way we think they should or things like that, then we, we can be shaken. But when our life is built upon the things that it needs to be built upon, then it's unshakable. And so, Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the goodness of God. We thank you for the word of God and for all that you've done for us. Jesus, we're yours. Let everything that we do in this moment recognize and honor you and just take into account all of who you are. Let us just, let us just build our lives upon you and that from this moment on point to you and all the stuff that we do. Lord, we pray for today. I, I, I pray, Lord, for all of us. I pray for our nation, Father. I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would help the local church to rise up and to do what it's called to do, to be who it's called to be. And Father, just to just demonstrate who you are, Lord. And so we thank you for all of that. I pray, Lord, that you would use me today. Lord, help me as I share today. Just let my words just penetrate any broken places, any hardened places, any wounded places. Father, help me with that in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I declare that this is a story-changing place, Jesus, because you're here. I call every seat full of people because people matter to you and, that, and you care about them. Have your way in our lives. Let the Holy Spirit do in us whatever it is that he wants to do. And Father, we just commit ourselves to you. And because you have been so good to us, we make ourselves vulnerable. We open our hearts up to allow you to correct us, to lead us, to encourage us. We say once again, we're yours. And so we love you with all of our heart. And because our confidence is in you, Jesus, we ask for all of this in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. Yeah. So aren't you glad to be in church today? Amen. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're here. I believe God's got something for us. And um, it's, you know, it's... Uh, I have an ability to state the obvious. It's one of my gifts, so I'm going to operate in my gift for a minute. It's been, a, it's been, at the very least, an interesting week in our nation. And so we're going to be talking about some things here in a little bit, just, you know, who we are, what God's called us to do. And um, I'm pretty confident that some of it's going to make us uncomfortable, quite honestly, um, because it makes me, I'm the one sharing it, and some of it I'm having to tell myself about and push through and um, you know, so we'll, we'll get there before we get to all that point where maybe you get mad at me or whatever. I want to show you a picture of what our future looks like. This is a picture of our future and I'm excited about that. Yeah. Just telling you, man, I want, I, uh, you can just see how the walls are coming up and, and everything's around. You can see the platform there, um, uh, and then, uh, just steps up to it. And I mean, it's just, it's just awesome. And I, I've walked in there this week a couple of times with those walls as they've come up and man, there's just been a presence in there, just a sense. It just compels me to stay and pray and just, um, I don't know, I just, it's, uh, you, I think you get it. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in there a few times and yesterday and I walked in there just uh, for a number of reasons, just felt compelled to pray uh, while I was in there for just a little bit. It's just, I'm excited. I'm excited about our future and so it's going to be a good future and let's clap one more time, man. We're just excited about things that are going Well, you know, this season of our, of our, in our nation, uh, every four years, it becomes pretty um, contentious, and it becomes uh, even, um, you know, just there's a lot of things going on uh, in us. And, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I know that I, when we think about elections, that there's kind of three stances or three things after an election is over. You have a group of people that are happy, you have a gr group of people that are sad or angry, and you have a group of people that are just ready for it to be over. And so, um, and so I, I wish, there's an element of me that wishes I could be in the third group that was just kind of like, I'm just glad this thing is over, you know, but um, that just, it's been one of those things, kind of the way I was raised, I'm, I'm always engaged, I'm studying, and, you know, and, I, and so I, internally, and for those of, you know, friends that are close to me, I have very, I have very strong opinions politically, and so, um, but also I know what my calling is as a pastor, that what I'm called to do what I'm not called to do. And so, you know, there are times, man, where I get to share things from the scripture that are just really exciting for me, and everybody's going to be like, yeah. But then there are other times we have to share things, and some people will be like, I'm so glad he's saying this. There's other people like, 
I hate that guy. And so this could be one of those, one of those mornings. And if I was sitting out there, I might be saying that too, like, I hate that guy. So, uh, but, you know, God's, he's got things that he tells us to do on a regular basis as to who we are as believers, as a body of Christ. And our first identity is not the color of our skin. The first identity is not our party affiliation. Our first identity is not even our earthly citizenship. Our first identity is that we are, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if Jesus is Lord of your life, then we're citizens of heaven. And we're part of the body of Christ, and we know each other as new creatures. And that's first. And so, um, you know, so... Uh, and, and again, it doesn't change the fact that you know, when my person wins, I'm, I'm like, praise God. And when my person loses, I'm like, what's wrong with people? You know, and so, um, so you know, and I, I will guarantee you that I've hit one of those emotions for most of you already. And, um, and we could kind of go home and just be in agreement and nobody would be mad at me. But um, we're going to do a little bit more than that. So anyway, are you ready? Yeah. All right, grab hold of your Bibles and say this with me. Say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I declare this morning, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, I'll be taught the word of God, and I'll never be the same again. Open up your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel. If you're still learning your way around the Bible, know that it's divided into two categories, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is, bef is before the birth of Jesus and starts with Genesis. The New Testament is from the birth of Jesus on. It starts with Matthew and Ezekiel's in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 22 is where we're going. Ezekiel is right before Daniel. That helps you out, right? You knew exactly where Daniel was. Like, oh, it's before Daniel. I know exactly where to get there. So um, it's right before Daniel. It's a few books after Psalms. And so Ezekiel 22. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet, and God would speak to him regarding the nation of Israel. And so this was one of the things that he was sharing with them. He was telling them, this it was kind of a prophetic thing. And so in Ezekiel 22, verse 23, um, it's, he says, he says, Again, a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, uh, give the people of Israel this message. In the days of my indignation, you'll be like a polluted land, a land without rain. Your princes plot conspiracies just as lions stalk their prey. They devour innocent people, seizing treasures and extorting wealth. They make many widows in the land. Your priests have violated my instructions and defiled my holy things. They make no distinction between what is holy and what is not. And they do not teach my people the difference between what is ceremonially clean and unclean. They, um, they are like wolves who tear apart their victims. They actually uh, destroy people's lives for money, and your prophets cover up for them by announcing false visions and making lying predictions. They say, my message is from the sovereign Lord when the Lord hasn't spoken a single word to them. Even common people oppress the poor, rob the needy, and deprive foreigners of justice. I, and so, let's stop right here for just a minute. So, right now, the Lord's kind of confronting them. He says, look, I want you to share this with them. And he's revealing to them that kind of just across the board, that they've, they've really, uh, you know, culturally and in every other way, that they've headed the wrong direction. And so, and he said, so much so that it's even, it's not just impacted just everyday people, but it's impacted your, your government officials. And he said, it's impacted, I, I want to say the church, but really back then they had the church, they had the synagogue and that type of thing. So he said, even, even your religious leaders have been impacted by these things. And so here's one thing we have to understand is that I think a lot of times we have this picture of God that he's kind of like up there in heaven with this big, like, you know, Texas size uh, fly swatter that the minute we blow it, he's kind of like, okay, I've been waiting for this opportunity, you know, and so... But that's not what he does. You know, the truth of the matter is, is that there's just decisions that we make or choices that we make or the way that we live our lives that in a sense kind of brings judgment into it. You know, in other words, like if I'm, if I'm always lying, then the judgment that brings into it is that people don't trust me, right? If I'm always doing things that I shouldn't do, then in that area, that there's, there's, a, there's a, you know, a consequence, a judgment that comes with that. And so he's confronting them with this. And if I were to stop right here, you know, there'd be somebody like, oh, man, I'll tell you what, you know, I, I, that's, that's what's hap getting ready to happen to, to the United States. It's been coming for a long time or, or whatever. And others may be like, well, you know, that was, that was going to happen, but thank God it's not. I mean, but he's getting ready to address the way that he deals with that or the way he fixes it, okay? And so let's look at this very next verse. And he said, I looked for someone. Everybody say someone. I look for someone who might rebuild the wall of righteousness that guards the land. In other words, he said that this wall of righteousness, this, this wall of 
endeavoring to follow him, you know, endeavoring to, to follow his presence, to live, let the life of God live through us, that there's a safety and a protection that comes in that for who we are. And he said, I was looking for somebody that could do that. He said, I searched for someone. Everybody say someone again. Someone. To stand in the gap in the wall so I wouldn't have to destroy the land, but I found no one. So he's saying that with all of these things going on, that his response to it was he looked for somebody that would stand in the gap in the wall. You know, now a wall, that's a visual picture that he's giving, that that created protection for them. He called it, you know, once, uh, earlier in that verse, he called it the wall of righteousness. And that, you know, he said, I'm looking for somebody to kind of rebuild this. And, you know, because it pro provided an element of protection. But because of what was going on with them, that apparently, that it, it's almost like this that things were taking place that was kind of lowering those things about who they were and who they are. And he said, I was looking for somebody to, to stand in the gap, you know, to kind of breach the, the, the wall. There had been this hole that had, had been made, and he was looking for somebody to fill the breach that had taken place there. And, and really what I think the implication here is, is that he was really looking for somebody that was willing to pray for the place that we live. Now, so many of the things we have to understand is when Scripture was written, and I believe it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, that when it was written that the idea of, of uh, you know, people having a vote and that type of thing, that it just wasn't even considered as a concept. And, and so when we talk about, like last week I talked about voting some and that I think it's, it is our stewardship. That if, you, if God in his sovereignty placed you here or somehow you ended up being a citizen of this land, first of all, I think, I think we're fortunate. I think we're fortunate to be a part of this nation. That one of the things that I personally believe for stewardship that we're called to vote and so, but as important as that is, that he spoke to people that had no voting privileges. When he said to his disciples, look, man, you're the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world, that he was letting them know when they could have felt very disconnected, they could have felt, you know, very disenfranchised, they had, they had no political influence, they had no military influence, they had no economic influence, no social influence, and yet he said this, you can still influence the world. You can still impact the place that you live. Yeah, we don't even get to vote. I know. And so right here, he said, look, he said, look, these things are getting ready to happen to the place that they were at. And he said, I'm just looking for somebody that will stand in the gap, that, that, that will cover the breach. I'm looking for somebody that will intercede that will, that on behalf of the people around them, the people that agree with them and the people that don't agree with them. I'm looking for somebody that will pray and, and just begin to lift up, you know, the place that they live. And he said, when that happens, it will begin to have an impact and to have an effect. And I, I know that in times like this, in seasons like this, again, depending on which side that we're on, I mean, or where we're at as a result of the election, that sometimes, you know, that if, if your person didn't win, that there can be this sense of hopelessness and this sense of disconnect or even anger and, and that type of thing. So the first point here is that I want us to see is that God is looking for a person who will pray for their country. I mean, it's easy, it's, easy to, it's easy to celebrate when things go well. It's easy to get angry when they don't go our way. It's easy to, you know, to be angry at one another when the other person doesn't see things the way that, that I see them or the way that you see them. It's easy to be angry at me if I don't see it the way you see it. But the greatest thing that we can do as Christians is to live out the life that Jesus has given us to those in front of us and to pray for our nation and to pray, you know, uh, just that's what we're called to do. That you and I as Christians are called to do that. So, number one is this, is that God is looking for a person who will pray for their country. Go with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy is in the New Testament. And so, um, uh, just to kind of get you there, you'll go past Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, and Romans, and First and Second Corinthians. You go past those guys. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy. Now... This is a letter that Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy. Paul was an older guy by now. He'd been, you know, he was coming you know, close to the end of his life. And some scholars think that he wrote this while he was in Ephesus. He was writing it to Timothy, mentoring him. Timothy was a young guy. He was mentoring for ministry. And so he shares different things in here. And the truth of the matter is, is that probably of all the things that I share today, this is going to be the thing that challenges you the most. And you say, why is that? Because in some situations, it challenges me the most. I'll be real transparent with you. There are times when I, when I preach this message, 
And I'm really, I mean, it's easy. I'm really excited. And I hope the people that disagree with me hear it. And there's other times that I preach this message and I'm like, can I, you know, Lord, can you just lead me to talk about something else today? I just want to be led to talk about something else today. So, so I'm sure that in the hearing that it'll be that way for some in here today. You know, you think about this, that, uh, and I, you know, I, I don't know, but um, you look at Oklahoma and, uh, you know, we, we tend to vote um, uh, Republican. And so, uh, you know, majority, I, I think we had over, there's over 60% that uh, went Republican for president and 30-some percent that went Democrat for president. And so if that's kind of the mixture of our church, then kind of based upon where things are headed at this time, that, you know, there's a fair amount of people in here that, you know, that don't like uh, if things continue going the direction they're going, don't like the outcome. And there's another group that are, like, pretty happy. And so, uh, but the truth of the matter is, again, that our identity is who we are as Christians. And so right here, Paul's writing this. And he said this, he said, I urge you, first of all, everybody say, first of all, first of all. to pray for all people. Everybody say, all people. all people. So let me just say this. He said, first of all, to pray for all people. Now, the Greek word that's used here for the word all literally means <clears throat> all. It literally means all, all right? <laughs> and so you didn't know that you're going to get a Greek lesson, and so... If you're wanting to know what that, what does that word really mean? It means everybody. And so it does, it means also we're called to pray for all people. So first of all, how many of you think that we should pray for all people? Let me see your hand. Okay, good. You're doing pretty good, but some of you have never passed the test before and never gotten an A, and I want this to be your first time. Some of you didn't raise your hand. The answer is yes, okay? So I'm going to ask that again. How many of you believe we're supposed to pray for all people? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's right. So some of you need to call your parents and say, I got my first day today. And so that's what happened, all right? I was in church. And so... He said, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask, so he said, here's the things that he told us to pray for them. Number one is ask God to help them. Ask God to help them. Lord, help them. Help them in their situation. Help them to know what they're supposed to do. Help them, Lord. If they're wrong, Lord, speak to them. Visit them. Help them. Ask God to help them. Second of all, he said this, intercede on their behalf. Now, some people, we don't, that's not a word that we use on a regular basis and we're like, what does that mean? And intercession means to appeal to God on behalf of another. To appeal to God on their behalf. In other words, they may not know they're supposed to pray. So as we think about it, we pray, we, we appeal to God on their behalf and ask him, you know, that, that it's like, Lord, I'm coming in their place. They may not know you. They may not even believe in you, but I'm praying for them on their behalf. I appeal for them because I know you don't... You know, that I may get irritated with them sometimes, but I know that you love them, and so I'm going to appeal to you on their behalf. And then he goes on to say, and give thanks for them, and give thanks for them. So in other words, after all, said, Lord, you know, thank you for them. We're, uh, no matter what they're going through right now, uh, that I, I, you know, I just give thanks for, for that person and ask you to just move on their behalf. So, so I think we're okay here, but here comes the place that we're going to be, some of us are going to be challenged. And he said this. So he told us to pray this way for everybody. You know, it's a real generic thing, and we're all on board on that. And then he says, pray this way for kings and all. There's that word all. And here's the thing about it is the word that's used earlier for the word all, that means everybody, is the same word that's used here, which means everybody that's in authority. So, again, that word all in the Greek means all. And so he said, pray this way for kings and all who are in authority. Not just the ones I agree with. They're easy to pray for. But the ones that I disagree with, all, that we're to pray this way for all. Now, this message would be a lot easier in July than it is a few days after we've all voted and, you know, and all those kind of things. And so I get that. And, um, you know, and, and I put the notes together several days or I, I knew what direction I was going several days before this, before we'd even voted. And so it's one of those things where it's like, um, you know, well, like I said earlier, Hitler, can you just lead me to do something else? But, um, but in this, that he's told us to pray this way. And again, pray what way? Well, pray, ask God to help them. Everybody that's in authority, ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. In other words, appeal to God on their behalf. Lord, visit them. Lord, put counselors around them to speak to them. Show up in their dreams. Show up in their thoughts. 
Father, we pray for them. And so we pray. It says we intercede. We ask God, Lord, help them. We ask him to do those things. And then here's, here's the part. And so he says also we can't be picky. It's all. It's everybody. Here's the part that can really be a struggle is that he said, first of all, to pray for all people, ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and then give thanks for them. Really? Give thanks? Oh, that's right. I mean, let's. And so he says, give thanks. And, and, and again, I'm talking about this, you know, again, if, if whenever there's an election, regardless of what year it is, if your person or your people win, it's easy to give thanks for them. But when it doesn't turn out the way we want it to, then to give thanks for them is like, ah, but you can't, can't you see what they're doing and what direction they're going? Give thanks for them. So he said, so he said, and all who are in authority, so that we can, and here's the reason why. So we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. In other words, one of the reasons we pray this direction is so we can live godly and have dignity in what we do. And he said this, he said, this is good. In other words, praying this way is good and pleases God. Praying this way is good and pleases God. And he goes on to say, uh, pleases God our Savior who wants everyone, everybody say everyone, everyone, to be saved and understand the truth. In other words, not to be so entangled in these other things that we get so wrapped up in what's going on, but to pray this way so that we can be about the work that we're ultimately put here to do, which is to introduce people to Jesus and to live our lives in such a way that we're a light to a dark world. And so that's who we're called to do, what we're called to do, who we're called to be. And sometimes that's real easy for me. Sometimes it's really hard. There are times, man, where in certain situations, during certain elections, that type of thing, if I stay in my head, I get angry. And I get mad. And I get frustrated. And I'm, I'm irritated. I'm irritated with the outcome. I'm irritated with people. But when I, get in my, when I get in my heart and I get to see what the Word says and what the Word tells me to do and what it's told me. And you know why it tells me to do this? Because he knew there would be times I wouldn't want to. And so he's called us to do this as believers, as Christians, and that to remind us that regardless of any election, regardless of if we think that whenever we have elections that the best person ever could have ever been elected, or that's the best president ever, or the worst president, regardless of that, that the truth of the matter is that every empire but one has an expiration date. And so it doesn't change the fact that I love this nation. My dad served in the military. Towards the end of World War II, he was a part of it. My uncle served in Korea. And so, you know, and I'm grateful for the military. I have family members that have been part of the military. I love this nation. I feel very fortunate that God, in his sovereignty, placed me here. But I'm a citizen of heaven. And so if you're a believer, if you're a Jesus follower, that's our first obligation and our first responsibility. So he's called us to do that. He's called us to pray, to ask God to help them, to intercede on their behalf, and to give thanks. You know what I've discovered? That it's hard for me to give thanks and complain at the same time. Have you ever tried that? God, thank you for this horrible car. I mean, you know, how do you, you know? Lord, I'm so grateful that I'm dead broke right now and can't pay a stinking bill. I mean, how, you know, you know, right? I mean, it's just, it's hard to do that. And I will tell you that because I'm, I'm not a guy that's disengaged from these moments. I realize what my calling is, and one of the reasons why I'm very careful about what I say from the platform is because first and foremost, I want to introduce you to Jesus. And so, you know, I mean, as a church, I will tell you that, we're, that Jesus gave the church, the body of Christ as a whole, before he ascended up into heaven, instructions. He said, go make disciples. And for us, that looks like this. We want to introduce people to a real relationship with Jesus because you need to know him. Second of all, and once that happens in your life, we want to help you connect with a small group because we believe that real change takes place. We believe in relationships here. And then lastly, we want to help you discover what your gift is so that you know what to do and you can use it as a story changer here. But even beyond these walls, that those things are what disciples do. It's what that looks like as a disciplined follower of Jesus. And so these other things, they matter to me. I get passionate about them. And I'm selective about the things, you know, 
what direction I go, who I vote for. I'm selected by who I share that with because I don't want to share that in somebody because of where they're at say, well, I don't want to hear anything else he has to say because if I do that at the expense of telling you about Jesus, I feel like I've missed it. I'm okay if you disagree with me. I'm telling you where I'm at. And so this is what God has called us to do as the body of Christ. So it's an interesting place that our nation is in, man. There's a huge amount of just anger out there and hostility out there, and it didn't just come this week. And so we as the body of Christ, and, and again, I believe in being strong. I believe in taking our stance, and, and you know, I know even when you talk about what the outcome is, it depends on who you talk, talk about the outcome of the presidential election. Some people say it's finished. Some people say it's not yet. And so you gotta, we've got to, you know, follow, you know, what we believe the Lord is, but it doesn't change the things that God has called us to do And he said, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Now, does everybody get saved? Unfortunately, no. But but as far as he's concerned, he wants them to. And I've thought about this in my own life that I imagine at times that if I had two glasses and one glass was all my complaining about people in leadership and that type of thing, and my other glass was uh, every time that I gave thanks, it got filled up. That sadly for me, there'd be many scenes in my life that this glass would be full and this glass would have drops in it. And I want to get to a place where I'm more thankful than I am complaining and be able to do that and fill this glass up regularly as God has called me to as a believer, as a Christian who ultimately, who ultimately will be with Jesus. So that's what God's called us to do. So number two is this is we're called to pray for our government leaders, regardless of who they are. Let me give you some historical context. Paul wrote this while he was in Ephesus, and Nero was the emperor. Some of you, that may not mean anything to you, but Nero was one of the greatest persecutors of the body of Christ in the history of Rome. He would light up his garden by burning Christians at the stake. He was ultimately the one that was responsible for Paul being executed. So Paul knew a little bit about having people in leadership that he didn't agree with. And this is what he wrote Timothy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. We need to let that sink in for just a minute. So, again, depending on which side of the coin you fall on, this this is easy to do right now. That if things go a certain direction... This is easy to do. If you fall on the other side of a coin, if they go that direction, then it's, you're struggling. But to understand, again, whose you are. Amen. Who you've made, G, you know, is Jesus your Lord? Who, who's, whose you are? Whose I am? And so as we make Jesus our Lord, then that's what takes place in our life. And so we're called to pray for our government leaders, regardless of who they are. So let's look at this last point, point. we'll close with this. Go with me, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles is in the Old Testament. It's like the um, 12th book of the Old Testament. It should be easy for you to find. It's right after 1 Chronicles. And so, um, thank you. I said that in the first service, and they didn't laugh at all. I think they were already mad at me by the time I got there. So anyway, um, first, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Verse 11. So it says, So Solomon finished the temple of the Lord as well as the royal palace. He completed everything he had planned to do in the construction of the temple and the palace. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as a place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then he said, Then. Everybody say, Then. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So he said, as things are going on, we should be praying regularly. But I don't know about you, but there are times that I get distracted. I get entangled in other things. And so I'm not praying like I should. And it could be one of those seasons that he's looking for somebody, somebody to fill in the gap. And he feels like, I can't find anybody to pray about this situation. And so we want to be aware and sensitive to the nudges of the Holy Spirit. But then there's moments like this where there could be things going on. And he said, you know, if you, you know and, and so many times as Christians, we could say, well, if, if they would just quit doing this and they would just quit doing that. And God's like, wait, 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 wait. He said, if my people 
which were called by my name. He said, well, first of all, will humble themselves. Now, humility is not my position before you. It's my position before God. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that once it's there, it does affect how I deal with you. And so humility starts here in a place that nobody can see but me and the Lord. Because sometimes we can look humble and it's just a matter of manipulation. But humility starts here and then it affects how I respond and what I do before you. So he said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. In other words, begin to talk to God, begin to seek him for those things. And then it says this, that not only to pray, he said, um, he said, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Begin to seek his face, his presence, what he wants to do, and turn. Everybody say turn. turn. From their wicked ways. In other words, you know, the, the people of God will examine their own lives, repent of, you know, when we repent of our sin, and turn from any disobedience that we're in, it, that, that, that matters. In other words, you know, it's real easy for us to look outside of the church and look at decisions that people are making that we know are clearly against the scripture. And be real angry at, you know, at the things that are being done and the decisions that people are being made. As opposed to in our relationship with the Lord to start and say, man, Lord, I just want to follow you. Is there any area of disobedience in my life that I, you, I need to turn from? And sometimes I don't have to ask. Sometimes I know. Matter of fact, most of the time I know. Maybe all the time I know. And so we turn from that. He's, he's not indifferent you know, again, it matters to him how we live. It matters to him the decisions we make. And so part of this is repenting on our behalf, turning from, from that disobedience, from that sin, back towards him. So he says this. He said, uh, and seek my face and turn the ways. He said, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore. Everybody say restore, restore. their land. My ears, my eyes will be open, my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. So he was talking to him. And, and he said, and he, what he wanted us to know is that our prayers can change things in our nation. The, and, I, and I mean, and the truth of the matter is, I'm saying our nation just because of, you know, that's kind of what we've been talking about. The truth of the matter is, our prayers can, it can change things in us first. As we humble ourselves, we seek his face, he begins to speak to me about things in my life. You know, things that, real everyday things. When I humble myself and begin to seek him, before I ever can talk to him about the big things in the world, he wants to talk to me about the big things in my life. Like, hey, dude, you're not loving your wife the way that I want you to. He's spoken to me about those things. We're not in an audible voice, but just through God thoughts or conviction. Hey, man, you really need to work on this attitude that you're carrying. He's dealt with me about that. I've shared with you before that sometimes, especially in the early years of our marriage, I say the early, like the the early 80, first 80% of our marriage, that whenever I would pray, <laughs> anyway, so uh, now my mind begins to roll. So uh, I could just do this for a while. So here's the thing is that, you know, I'd, I'm, I would pray and it'd be like, I'd start out with like, Lord, yeah, can you believe that she did that, that kind of thing. And, and like I said before, he never wanted to talk to me about her. He never, I never sensed a God thought that was like, oh, yeah, hey, man, she was really wrong. I mean, yeah, he never said that or yeah, how do you put up with that? You know, I mean, it was never one of those kind of things. It was more like, how does she put up with you, dude? I mean, it's like, okay, Lord, I think you've got somebody else here. So, I mean, but he, you know, he deals with us about those things. He speaks to us about it. You know, and, and hey, you've got this disobedience or, you know, you're, you're making a decision here. and this, You're doing this thing that I'm not okay with. It's wrong. And he speaks to me about those things, which then enables me to talk to him about other stuff. You know, and I mean, I can talk to him about that anyway. But again, because we have this relationship with him. So our prayers can change things in our lives, personally change things. They can change things in our nation, affect the course, affect the, dir the direction of our country. And we, if you're a Christian, if you've made Jesus Lord of your life, then part of the great calling of God that he's given us is to pray for our nation, to pray to fill in the breach, to fill in any places that there are gaps or holes in who God's called us to be and what pleases him as a country. I can spend all day long, and believe me, I can do it complaining, being angry. I can begin to pray and ask God to help people in positions of authority. I can begin to lift them up. I can begin to intercede, take access you know, to go in their place because they may not know to go. 
I've shared with you before, I was mad at somebody one time, really irritated, and I was praying for him. Oh, that's a good thing. No, it wasn't that kind of prayer. <laughs> it was like, you know, just judge him. Let the fires of heaven just consume him. You know, I mean, I'll, you know, <laughs> let him get hit by a dump truck. I mean, you know, those kind of things right there. And this God thought of like, I don't feel about them like you do. Just like I'm patient with you whenever you blow it, I'm being patient with them right now. Just like you want patience, you want, you want patience, you want mercy, I'm giving that to them too. I'm like, I'm just going to watch TV, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, because he doesn't always agree with me when I'm praying, you know? It's just one of those things that he just, it's what he, you know, that, I mean, he, he's not looking to have, he's not, he doesn't want... He doesn't, want, he, you know, he doesn't want to be like my heart. He wants my heart to be like his. And so our prayers can change things in our nation. They can. And, and affect the direction that we go. But I was you, but the problem in my life is that I spend so time, little time doing that and so much time doing these other things that don't, they don't serve any eternal purpose. Complaining. All, just all sorts of things. And, and again, I may just be speaking to myself. You may not struggle with any of this. So if so, just thanks for being a part of my personal therapy session. <laughs> so, but the, the, the truth of the matter is that this is, you know, that as the body of Christ, again, that our time is so short. You believe these are last days? Maybe. They're my last days. I don't have another life. When I say last days, I mean I mean from a biblical standpoint, you know, and that kind of thing. I don't, hopefully I'll be here next Sunday. But here's the thing <laughs> is that just to get that, to get that, I want us to do this. I'm going to pray right now. I'm going to pray right now. And so I want us to bow our heads. I'm going to pray. And then when I'm praying, I'm going to give you just a moment to be with God and let you pray, Okay. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we do lift up our nation. I pray, Lord, for everyone that's in authority right now, regardless of what party they're in, regardless of what affiliation, regardless, Lord, I pray for them. I lift them up, and I ask that you help them, just like you told us to, for all of them, that you would help them. Father, I intercede on their behalf. I go into your presence on behalf of them. And there are some that know you. There are some that know to talk to you. There are some that don't. There are some that even in their stances are in opposition to you, and I pray for them too. Father, visit them, all of them. Visit them in their thoughts and in their sleep. Visit them in their conversation. If they've been wounded in the past by things that were, were intended to draw them to you, then I pray that you'd heal those wounds. If they've been hardened by those things, I pray that you'd soften those. That, Lord, nothing's too hard for you. And so I pray for them. And Lord, I, I, I thank you for those in the position that has been created there and what its intent is. I not only pray for them, but I pray for those that are soon coming in, whoever they are, whatever position they hold. I ask that you help them. Father, I intercede on their behalf. I pray that, that supernaturally you would deal with them, supernaturally you'd speak to them. And for any that have hardened their heart to you, I pray, Father, supernaturally that you'd send people in their life that, again, that as you visit them in their thoughts and their sleep and their imagination and conversation, that it would begin to have an impact on their heart. Lord, thank you. Thank you for placing us in this land and giving us an opportunity that people throughout centuries have not had the opportunity, and that's to vote and to have a say. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, as a church, we lift that up, first of all, as you place it here, as you look for somebody, let us say, use me. But Lord, also, as, as we say that, we pray for that so that we can live godly lives, quietly and peaceable, because you want people to be saved. You want them to come to know you. Jesus, you didn't come because humanity needed another religion. You came so that we could have a relationship with you, be forgiven of our disobedience, of our sin, and have a relationship with the Father where we engage with that and become sons and daughters. And so we pray, one of the reasons we pray is for this. Let us move forward.
Let us remind ourselves and the people around us that Jesus is the hope of the world. Not politics, not government systems. Jesus is. And that the church is what he chose to manifest that hope to humanity. The body of Christ. And so we lift it up, Lord, help me. For any, any that are struggling today, Lord, just give direction, give, just help, help, help all of us, Father. Lord, we look to you, and we just want to please you and honor you in all that we do, and not lose sight of whose we are. So we commit this to you, and we spend just a moment with you secretly, where just, just you know what's taking place in that secret place in our heart as we talk to you. So just, you just there secretly with the Lord, just spend a moment with him. Father, we thank you. Our hope is in you. Our hope is in Jesus. And Lord, we just take this moment again and as we, we want to be, as you look for those, that for any, any holes in the wall, that we would be there to, to, to just fill the gap. To be a place of safety and protection. And Lord, to, to pray for those in leadership, even the ones, maybe even especially the ones we don't agree with, so that we can continue to lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty so that people can come to know Jesus. And Father, let us not underestimate our opportunity to pray. It's more powerful than any civic duty. It's more powerful than any of those things that we're afforded as citizens of this place. Because it gives us access to you. So we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Before we go, man, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're in here today, if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life and you want to do that today, I, I want to pray for you. You know, being a Christian is more than just believing in God, but it's this awareness that all of us have sinned. We all have. And, and that even though God is love, he's also just. And because of that, he, he, can't, ignore, he can't ignore my sin. He, he can't ignore our sin. And so Jesus came, and because he loved us, he took that sin upon him and the judgment of that sin upon him so that when we make Jesus Lord of our lives, receive him as our Savior, that we can step out from underneath judgment, and we're made right with God. The Bible says justified. In other words, he deals with us just as if I'd never sinned. So if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life and you want to do that today, man, I, I want to pray for you. Second of all, if you're here and you say, you know, um, I've, I've done that, but man, I've gotten off track. And I want to get back to the place that I was, can I? Absolutely you can. You say, well, how do you know? Because I've gotten off track before too. I know what that's like. So if that's you, I want to pray for you. If you want to rededicate your life, he will restore you personally. I know from experience. And then lastly, if you're here and you say, you know, sometimes I think I'm a Christian. But other times I struggle with what if I'm not and if that's you, I, I want to pray for you because I think you can leave here knowing that you're his. So for any one of those three things, whether to give your life to Jesus for the very first time or to recommit your life to him or just to leave here knowing with a certainty that you belong to him, if that's you on any one of those three things, I want to pray for you today with heads bowed and eyes closed just so I know who I'm praying for. If that's you, would you raise your hand and hold it up real quick? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to join these? Awesome. Awesome. All right, I want to pray for you. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for each person that's raised their hand. Lord, I know that you love them, but Father, in this moment, if they've never made Jesus Lord of their life, I pray that in this moment, that they would commit themselves unto you, that they would receive who Jesus is and what he's done, and say that they will follow him from this moment on, give their lives to him, and they would become a new creature in Christ. Old things will be passed away and all things will become new. And Father, for any that are recommitting their lives, I thank you that you'll restore the joy of their salvation. That they'll leave here reminded of who they are. Reminded of who they've been, 
what they've been called to do and, and who you are and reconnected to the plan and purpose of God again. Just this sense of forgiveness one more time. And lastly, Lord, for any of those that are struggling with, am I really saved? That they, when they leave here, they'll know they're yours, not because they feel like it, because some days I don't feel like it. And they'll leave here, they'll know they're yours, not because they always act like it, because some days I don't act like it. But they'll know they're yours because you said whoever calls on Jesus will be saved. So on the days I don't feel like it, and even on the days I don't act like it, I know I'm yours because my confidence is not in how good I feel or even how good I am. It's in what Jesus has done and what your word says. And I pray that's where their confidence rests too. And so I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Now look, I prayed for you, and that's good. We should pray for each other. But again, God, he doesn't want a religion where somebody else does all your talking to him. He wants a relationship where you and he talk. So I want to lead you in a prayer if you raise your hand. And I want you to be able to be bold and passionate about this and to just, you know, just to let God do what he wants to do in your life. And because we're for you, I'm going to ask you to repeat after us, but I'm going to ask everybody in here to repeat after me because it's good to reaffirm our faith as well. So let's all say this, but if you raise your hand, make this yours. Let's say this. Say, Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, be Lord of my life. I know what that means. That means I'll do what you say. To the best of my ability. And with your help, I'll follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for all my sins. And I believe with all my heart that you were raised from the dead so I could be forgiven. I call upon you now. And ask you to forgive me and to live in me. And I thank you for forgiving me and saving me and loving me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Isn't that great? Well, I'm so glad you're here. Before I turn this over to Pastor Mike, you know, as you came in, uh, you probably know somebody stole our wall last night, so I don't know what that was about, but... Uh, no, actually, we, uh, we were, as I mentioned last week, we're going to have to build a couple of extra nurseries just because of, you know, that our nurseries are getting full. And we're building a, a, a hallway that will connect this part of the facility to Cedar Point Kids so that especially when weather's inclement, you can stay inside as you walk down the hallway. So we've got that going, all right? So anyway, I love you guys. I'll see you at the door. Pastor Mike, come on up here. Isn't that exciting stuff? Y'all excited? We are too. Well, at this time, if you guys would, in the seat back in front of you is a white information card. If you would take just a moment to fill out these cards for us, I promise you it will not take you very long to fill these out at all. We would just greatly appreciate that. There's a place there on the back where you can share any prayer requests that you have. We love knowing what it is that you guys are believing and praying for and being able to hook our faith up with your faith. And so, again, if you guys would just fill these out. And then as you're leaving today, back by the back door, we're going to have some ushers that will have a bucket back there. You can just drop that completed card into the bucket as you're leaving. While y'all are taking just a moment to fill those out, I want to talk to those of you that made that decision today to either give your life to Jesus for the very first time or you made that decision to rededicate your life and share with you some next steps that we as a body uh, want to encourage you to take. And one of those is this. As you're leaving back by the back door, we're going to have ushers. They're going to have a black bag with the word Cedar Point on it. We want to encourage you to pick up one of those black bags because inside of that black bag is going to be a Bible and more information about the next steps that you can be taking to help you continue to start this relationship with God or grow in your relationship relationship with God. And it's going to go over things like our growth track, which takes place every Sunday um, on our online format. Uh, online, Just go to our homepage here at the church and you'll be able to find more information about that. You can also, um, we all want to encourage you to take another step and that's to get baptized. At the end of this month, we're having a beginnings weekend. And at the end of that, with, with a part of that weekend is our uh, baptisms. And so we just want to make you aware of that. Let the rest of the world know what Jesus has done in your life. And there's going to be plenty more information about your next steps there. And so we want to encourage you to pick up one of those. At this time, though, we do have a couple of quick video announcements that we want to roll for you. Just want to remind you guys that due to the season that we're in, we're not going to be passing the offering buckets down the rows. And so um, as you give today, you can give electronically with our uh, Push Pay app. You can text to give to the number that's there on the screen. And if you do want to give um, through the offering envelopes there, again, you can just drop those into the bucket as you guys are leaving today. With that being said, though, let's check out these quick announcements. Hey Cedar Point family, thanks for spending part of your weekend here with us at Cedar Point. We've got just a few announcements for you and your family, so sit back and check them out. 
November 20th and 21st, we've partnered with Main Street Claremore for their annual Dickens on the Boulevard celebration. This is a Victorian theme event and we are providing a kid zone. So grab your family and join us for this fun event. On November 22nd, during our weekend experience, our Cedar Point kids are having a Friendsgiving. So if you have children from first to fifth grade, be sure and send a dessert with them that day and encourage them to invite a friend. We hope to see you there. Our Cedar Point students will not be meeting on November 25th to celebrate the Thanksgiving season. Don't forget, we're going to be celebrating baptisms, baby dedications, and the Oklahoma Blood Institute will be here receiving blood donations that day. If you want to take part in any of those three things, sign up at the Info Center. Thanks again for joining us today at Cedar Point. We hope to see you right back here next week. Well, as you guys saw there, the 29th is a big day for us because we've got our beginnings weekend, but that night we're having our Advent service here, and so we just want to make you aware of that. We're going to have a traditional field during our services, and then afterwards we're going to have some activities, pictures with Santa and Coco, and so we want to make you aware of that. The 29th is going to be a big day for us. With that being said, though, thank you all so much for being with us. You guys are dismissed. We love you all. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>